the remote uh, participation and the webcast to be ready and we will be starting very soon. This is quite uncomfortable. Good morning. Um, welcome to the workshop 38 about international cooperation between certs, technical diplomacy for cybersecurity. And uh, note that this is a question, so we are here to explore whether cert cooperation is or not a form of diplomacy. Let me give you a bit of background. My name is Pablo, I work for EPINIC. Uh, EPINIC is the regional internet registry for Asia Pacific. We uh, serve as the IPv4, IPv6 address registry of around 16,000 networks. And our aim is to support internet development in Asia Pacific and to promote an open, stable and secure internet. We are part of the technical community and our voice is mostly the voice of network operators and network engineers in Asia Pacific. More and more, uh, our members, APNIC members, uh, the network operators, have come to us asking for support uh, with their cybersecurity needs. So a few years ago, with my colleague Adli, uh, we started an effort to connect and establish a closer relationship between the network operator community and the computer emergency response uh, team, CERTs and CSERTs, in the region and beyond. This has been a great experience and uh, not only of benefit to APNIC members, but uh, we really hope uh, that it has had also a positive impact on the internet ecosystem. And we are very much committed to uh, the view of the internet as an ecosystem, and that is why we cannot see network operators and certs working in isolation. And that brings us here to the IGF, uh, which is a great platform to connect isolated groups that could be working closer together for the good of the global internet. So that is one bit of background. Um, the second part, uh, I have had the great fortune to have met Duncan and Madeline uh, a couple of years ago, and we had many discussions, uh, and we agreed on one thing, probably on a few others, but <laughs> one main thing, and that was the fact that international discussions in the field of information security have grown in parallel, not together, to the international discussions in the field of internet governance. And these discussions, if taken to a decisional level, eventually, uh, will have a profound impact on the way networks operate. And we also felt that a good idea would be to connect international law experts working on information security with public policy experts working on internet wars governance with also the technical community. So last year in Mexico, we organized a workshop on the subject of cyber norms. And I think we were successful in bringing together disparate groups and start a dialogue. Uh, we had members of the UN governmental group of experts and international law experts and members of the technical community. And we talked about trust and how internet governance participatory schemes could feed into discussions about responsible state behaviors and protecting the public core of the internet. So it is, uh, 
for me, uh, a great honor and pleasure to be working with Madeleine and Duncan uh, on a second workshop here in Geneva. It is somehow a sequel, but has been designed with a different approach. Uh, like the first workshop on cyber norms, um, this is also about connecting the internet technical community, this time the CERT community, the CCERT community, with international security experts. So there is ongoing academic research analyzing cooperation, information sharing, and trust protocols among the CERT community and interpreting them as an effective diplomatic endeavor. The question here is whether there are lessons to learn uh, and concepts to share uh, from the CERT community that could be useful to disentangle international cybersecurity discussions, inform treaty level initiatives, and foster responsible state behaviors. The workshop here is a bit of a risky proposition because the CERT community is very much focused in what they do, responding, responding to incidents and solving problems. They, I don't think, they see themselves as cyber diplomats. Meanwhile, international cybersecurity discussions among states uh, are somehow detached uh, from the day-to-day -day operation of, of networks. So the idea here is to find a space in which these communities can communicate with each other and contribute with their uh, processes. Before we proceed, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this room, uh, as you can see and feel, is not very amicable to what we are trying to do. So we will need to work against architecture. And this is why we have a bit of a strange seating arrangement for the core group that will participate here. Um, the idea is that this session will be recorded and it is being web streamed uh, uh, right now. And the camera is over there. <laughs> <laughs> So um, when you speak, uh, it would be great if you can speak very close to the microphone because it is also being transcribed and the transcribers are suffering a lot from lack of uh, proper audio. So, and this is very uncomfortable. I am trying to speak close to the microphone and it is difficult, but please do speak close to the microphone. Um, the transcription only works if audio is clear. Um, so we're trying to foster a dialogue Please avoid long interventions like mine. Uh, aim for three minutes and do not exceed five. Um, and now I will give the floor to Madeleine to introduce the experts and get deep into the subject. Thank you, Pablo, and, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. Um, as Pablo said, we're really excited about building these links between uh, different communities that indeed come to the IGF, but very often sit in different rooms in the IGF. And so we're very grateful for you uh, all, all being here this morning. My, I'm an international relations academic, and my area of research is uh, the international political dimensions of uh, cybersecurity and, and international and uh, internet governance. So I look at the way that states uh, and non-state actors uh, co cooperate, uh, compete, uh, try to collaborate, try to uh, find some mechanisms for dispute resolution in this space. And uh, it's become increasingly clear to me over the years that I've been doing this that these issues cannot be addressed within uh, a single discipline alone. And, and for that reason, actually, I've recently moved from a Department of International Relations to the Faculty of Engineering at, at University College London. So if we look a little bit at, at how these issues have come to the international political agenda, I mean, for, for, for many years, decades, uh, some states have been producing national security strategies where they kind of look at the global uh, geopolitical context and they provide some kind of assessment of their place in that, uh, in that context. In 2003, the United States produced its first national cyber security strategy. Uh, prior to that, cyber had been folded into the, the general security strategy of, of these states. And after 2003, other states rapidly began to follow by producing these national cyber security strategies in which they would uh, yeah, look at the context, look at, at, at geopolitics, look at their own capabilities and kind of uh, devise some kind of uh, strategy for, for forward momentum. Now, following this, there became also this momentum for states to develop 
uh, certs or C certs. And, and both of these things really came to be seen as a sign of, of maturity of a state. If they had developed a national cybersecurity strategy and they had established a cert, then they were seen to be kind of on their way to, uh, you know, some kind of um, maturity in this context and some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, capacity to deal with the complexities of, of global cybersecurity. What we saw sort of happen sort of quite quickly after that was this tension emerge because while states were, were very keen to establish certs and for all kinds of, of good reasons, it, it, it became evident that the kind of close working of a cert and a national government, especially the intelligence community, could actually undermine the efficacy of a cert because for all kinds of reasons that we're going to discuss later, I don't need to, to kind of preempt too much for this, for this room. Um, but essentially, these certs struggled to maintain their independence and their autonomy. So th th this problem emerged that, that governments want to establish certs, that they feel they need certs, and they have good reasons for that, but that too close a collaboration can actually undermine this, the certs. So this was the kind of problem that, that uh, we have been looking at. Um, now, recently, uh, the United Nations group of governmental experts uh, in, in 2015, was it 2015 or 13? My mind's gone blank. 15, 15 yes, thank you. <laughs> and, and Karsten is, is here who's going to speak uh, explicitly about this. Basically, this UN group got together to try and establish some, what we could say, rules of the road for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And they proposed 11 um, rules or suggestions or, or norms, they call them. One of them dealt explicitly with certs, and it had two parts to it. It said that states should not conduct knowingly, uh, they should not knowingly support activity to harm certs. So certs should not be part of uh, any kind of political conflict, and also that certs should not be used uh, to, to, uh, for offensive uh, state-based state, state behavior, malicious activity. Now, that kind of it signals how certs are being brought into this political agenda, they are now, certs are now definitely a, a component of the, the geopolitics of, of cybersecurity. Uh, wh whether that's a good or a bad thing, they are. And, and, and so part of the research that we've been uh, looking at is this idea of science diplomacy. And science diplomacy is in, in a very simple um, it, it's an established body of work, and it looks at ways that scientists can sometimes do things, they can lead cooperation that politicians are unable to. So in very difficult political um, contexts, scientists can, can very often overcome that, and they can cooperate together in a way that's not possible politically. So that's just, that, that doesn't mean that search should be diplomats. It doesn't mean that they are diplomats. It's just a lens that we have been looking through. How is it that these certs are able to cooperate across political divides when in, in uh, global politics we seem to be a little bit stalled with, with uh, cybersecurity? So with that, I, I want to hand over to uh, Leonie Tanzer, who, who uh, I work closely with, who's been doing some really interesting research in this. And, and Leonie, maybe you can just share a little bit of the work that, that we've been doing here. Sure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm probably one of the proponents of the idea of science uh, diplomacy and certs. And, uh, we consider them as an inadvertent science diplomatic actor, and we base this on a research we are currently conducting at the University College London. Um, uh, and we've so far conducted nine, uh, 20 interviews uh, with various certs, and this is also a call for other actors to come forward if they would like to be participating in the research on uh, certs uh, practices and their role in the international cybersecurity network. Um, and I want to use this opportunity to basically make three points that we found in the course of our research, and uh, Madeline already highlighted it. One of them is that C-certs, computer emergency response teams, are and, uh, are, um, and P-certs as well, so product incident response teams, are increasingly uh, being or should be con or could be considered as uh, diplomatic actors, and we base that on the fact that um, 
just like scientists collaborate in, former, for, uh, uh, in foras and the CSER community as a technical community collaborates across nations' borders, it's a multi-stakeholder group and there's three particular aspects. One can see that there's uh, a diplomatic element to their work. There's a lot of formality or, or in, as well as informality. So one thing I've learned is if you want to build trust, you go for a pint with someone. Um, uh, the other thing is that there's a lot of community around CSIRT, so um, if you ever have the chance to go to a first uh, or a technical colloquium or, or meeting, uh, mm -hmm. you will experience that they have a lot of like uh, informal and formal structures to all cooperate, and that is the last point uh, around their uh, diplomatic element, that they kind of uh, consolidate a nature of a community that negotiates, that mediates across different cultures and practices, and that is important for information sharing and to secure uh, the internet infrastructure and respond uh, um, sufficiently to uh, cybersecurity incidents. Um, the other important point I want to make is uh, the increasing professionalization. Um, so what we mean with that is um, that in the course of the interviews we identified that a lot of um, C certs and P certs um, really uh, uh, engage in like formal and informal networks um, that are now also increasingly being formalized. And uh, one example of this is the uh, upcoming NIST directive, where C certs play an important role and where uh, European Union member states are basically encouraged to put the finger at one specific national search that should uh, cooperate uh, across borders and, and, and facilitate the C cert cooperation within the nation state and across. Um, and one important aspect is, of course, the first community in this regard um, that plays an important role, and uh, I'm sure uh, colleagues on the panel will go into more depth of that. But one interesting aspect we see is that group size here um, by CSERTs becoming more, more established and bigger, and there's issues around like split uh, groups that like focus primarily, for example, on, on financial issues um, because it's harder to share information in a massive group um, where there's various political actors involved and where it might be um, a, an issue around uh, a, like being concerned about like sharing certain information. And that is the last point I want to make, which I think is the one that really struck me when I, when I conducted the in, uh, interviews. It's the politicization of C-certs. Now, the politicization of cybersecurity is an established concept. We see that in, concept, uh, in the issue of malware, as Kim Setter has, for example, highlighted this. But what we see, and I think what is an important incentive for discussions today, is that um, C-certs um, are increasingly being uh, overshadowed by or being interfered by with governmental actors because cybersecurity is increasing a national issue, it's nationalized uh, to a certain extent, and uh, whereas the technical community of certs have established out of a need-driven basis, um, uh, now that there's uh, uh, increasing formalization and states for example, establish their own CSERTs. Uh, this has an effect on the trust networks that have established over years and decades. Um, and CERTs are a purely defensive tool, and um, I think that is now important also to discuss in the regards to the UNGGE um, uh, discussions, that um, one needs to acknowledge that the CSERT community has a specific role, a trust network that requires uh, this freedom to interact across borders, and they do that currently very effectively, but we do see an increasing threat by incorporating CSERTs, for example, under certain ministries or into certain bodies like national cybersecurity centers that then are, for example, associated with actors and uh, bodies that might counteract like incident response because vulnerabilities are something one can exploit. Um, this can interfere with the trust network. And I think this is one important aspect that I think we also need to address today and in the future. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the first actors of this panel have uh, something to say that as well. And I think it's a good uh, step forward uh, to open up this debate and as well on Monday there was the incident response for policymaker session, which I think uh, is a good way to have this cert community and policymakers to come together and discuss this issue in more depth. So, thank you. Thank you, Leone. And um, now uh, I wanted to bring in Adli Wahid, who is a uh, security specialist at, at APNIC and is very involved in the, the cert community. And um, Adli, amongst um, your other comments, I wondered maybe if you could elaborate a little bit on what you see as the role of, of CERTs or C-CERTs in international peace and security. Thank you very much, Madeline. Hi, my name is Adli Wahid from APNIC, uh, but I am also part of first form of incident response and security team with my friend here, Martin. 
Um, I'd like to touch upon uh, two topics um, um, in this conversation. One is um, basically talk a little bit about certs and why we cooperate, uh, and secondly, about how we cooperate uh, so that um, I think uh, attendees in this session can understand a little bit about the motivation and why we do this, this kind of thing, and perhaps uh, then relate to the, the, the bigger conversation about participation uh, of CERT or CERT within the realm of you know, political activities and so on and so forth. So I think one thing uh, that I should put in context is that the internet is very distributed so that when you have a security incident, um, there is a need to be able to, number one, respond quickly to mitigate or to make sure that the damage can be contained that it will not di uh, distribute uh, further uh, and cause more, uh, more damage. So there's an interest there not to just protect your own network, but also the networks in general, I mean the bigger networks, right? Because um, you would not want, for example, uh, financial losses to be uh, accumulated, to be increased, or you don't want to, to have the stability of the internet to be affected, right? Uh, so while the word certs or the term C certs tend to sound very reactive, um, but the whole incident response process is actually very proactive, right? So you can see that, for example, when there is an incident, the CSERT community is interested to know what other people are seeing. Uh, can we know, you know, um, how the attack works? Uh, what are the indicators, right? And from there, it will help other people to perform some analysis, right? To, so that you know, certain app, uh, mitigation uh, steps can be applied. Uh, and in the end, you know, the lessons learned all, out of this whole thing so that we can use it uh, in making better policies or, uh, or improving cybersecurity in general. So the CSERT community work closely with one another, um, and, and this is not a new thing. Uh, in fact, I think the first CERT was established many, 30 years ago, perhaps, uh, after the Morris Worm. And in fact, FIRST is also celebrating its 30th anniversary next year, right? So the community had existed for a long time. And one thing that I hear more and more in the conversation uh, about CERTs within the I guess the uh, other stakeholders' uh, domain, especially the non-technical community, is that, oh, you know, we focus on national certs and you know, the need for nations to work together through the national certs and so on and so forth. But you must understand that many of the certs are not related to nations, right? Uh, in fact, many of the first membership are private certs who are certs that belong to hospitals, to you know, academia, to, you know, to bank, and so on and so forth. So even without um, documented um, policies on how countries should talk to one another, the CERT community do engage with one another actively uh, through various means. Uh, one of it is, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, through information sharing. So we share information about threats, but there are also a lot of activities that happen outside crisis time, right? So these are things where a CERT could send an advisory to another CERT uh, or share best practices or how we set up our certs, for example. Some cert host another cert for internship and things like that. Uh, certs do work together in cybersecurity exercises to increase preparedness, to understand who is at the other end, right? Uh, who is the other person that is answering the phone? So it's more than just establishing institution relationship, but also trying to establish human-to-human -human relationship so that you know, at a time of crisis, I'm very comfortable to call Martin at 3 a.m. in the morning, and he will not be mad at me, <laughs> right? Uh, because we have that relationship. Um, and I think the other aspect of uh, how we do, how we share information sharing is just, you know, getting together and share insights, you know, what people are seeing, you know, uh, what, are, what are the difficulties in applying uh, you know, some form of mitigations, uh, is there a way forward uh, to improve things. And all of this may sound like it happens naturally, but it doesn't. Um, there is a lot of efforts within the communities to develop some kind of a protocol for information sharing. So for example, uh, if you go to FIRST website, you'll find this TLP, the Traffic Light Protocol. And this sets some expectation on how information will be shared and can be shared uh, with, with one another. Uh, there is a lot of activities also in developing tools uh, where you know certs share a lot of information on um, things that they use to either automate or to make things more effective when it comes to information sharing. So it's more than just you know, sharing a piece of advice, but also you know, people getting together to develop and work on projects. So I hope that uh, you know, within that few minutes, I've highlighted one, uh, why we do work together, and secondly, why, how we actually uh, work together to, uh, to have uh, better collaboration and coordination when it comes to information sharing. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Adley. That was a fantastic uh, overview of a, a long, complex, mature uh, community. So well done in, in three minutes. I um, wanted to bring in Martin Van Hornbeck now. Um, Martin is, is uh, um, at first the, the um, Industry Association of CERTs and um, obviously has a, a, a very um, sophisticated perspective on this as well. And Martin, I, I wondered if you could also, uh, amongst your comments, if you could um, maybe make a comment on how the CERT community sees this UNGGE norm about protecting CERTs and not engaging them in, in political conflict, if you have a view on that. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here today and, and speak with you. It's a great question, and I think uh, C-certs and, and certs don't see themselves as political actors. They see themselves as engineers, technical community members that work together to deal with incidents. And I actually want to jump back a little bit to something that was said earlier, which is the nationalization of cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity isn't actually a national concept. By definition, it's almost impossible to make it that because we all rely on cooperation, uh, C-certs in particular, to actually be able to deal with security incidents. For example, we all use software that was written in other countries. When there's a security vulnerability in that software, we need to be able to engage with the vendor and the, the individuals that have written that software in order to get a patch. And outside of that, C-certs can help mitigate, but they can't actually fix the issue. And the reason why I think this is important is because um, the risk of calling this science diplomacy is that it actually puts some power, some control with governments on what it is that CSIRTs can do and how they can engage. And I'll, I'll really quickly use a, a short example of where that can lead to trouble. Um, and it's an example that's a little bit more on the extreme end, but I think it's, it's very relevant to the discussion. In about 2011, um, there was a piece of malware that was written about at the time by um, a particular incident response team in Iran. And they wrote that there was a uh, particular um, malware that they referred to as STARS. And the technical community, the CSIRT community all across the world read about it and they kind of had to discard it because they didn't really have ways to engage because of uh, government sanctions and so on. So it wasn't taken very seriously and it wasn't really very well investigated. A few months later, that malware sample actually did make its way into the international community. And it was very easy to tie this new sample together to that report because the sample actually generated an image of stars that had some data encoded in it. Now, what made this relevant was that that particular sample actually exploited a security vulnerability in a very well-known word processor that a lot of individuals across the world use. And because there was no real ability of the CSIRTs to engage at an international level with that CSIRT in Iran that actually reported the issue, um, that vulnerability didn't make its way into the wider community until several months later, which also meant that the patch for that vulnerability was delayed, which essentially exposed users all across the world. Now you could make the argument that someone who is attacked with a particular vulnerability doesn't have any incentive to share that vulnerability with the CSERT community. And that's actually somewhat inaccurate in a sense that even a government doesn't have the ability to protect all of their infrastructure when they do not have access to a patch by the vendor. They can mitigate and they can fix certain minimal things, but they can't make sure that they actually are not, not completely compromised or that they don't have any gaps in their defensive posture there. So I think it's important to recognize that some political acts can actually make CSERT cooperation far more difficult. And if we turn what we do, science diplomacy, it creates a form of agency for the government to be able to make decisions on whether or not a sea search should engage. And I think that's something that we should somewhat shy away from as a technical community, because what we do is we identify when there's an issue, we res help resolve the issue, and we coordinate with all the stakeholders, and we move back to normal. In terms of the UNGGE norm in particular, um, I can tell you that within the CSERT community there's actually very little discussion about that norm, uh, in the sense that I'm, I'm fairly certain that a lot of the technical community isn't aware of the existence of the norm and to what degree any implementation effort may be underneath it to actually put it in place. I think it is highly relevant, but I also think it is somewhat restrictive in the sense that when you think of compromises on CSERT, it's actually difficult to come up with a good example of a CSERT that was compromised by another state. However, 
There are several examples of infrastructure that supports the CSIRT that was compromised by other states. A great example in that field is, for instance, antivirus vendors. There have been several examples of antivirus vendors being compromised and being leveraged to um, perform something that is in inherently an offensive act or is something that would undermine the ability of the antivirus vendor to help defend. Now, an antivirus vendor typically isn't, doesn't fit into the definition of a C-cert um, when you think about national certs or you even think about product security incident response teams. But in a way, it is infrastructure that is leveraged by the CSERT community to actually uh, defend two incidents. And so I think it's important to think about the wider context as well and wonder if the norm in that sense is truly effective or if there's a lot of implementation work that needs to, uh, needs to happen underneath. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Louise Marie Hurrell now, who works specifically on uh, uh, questions of, of cybersecurity governance at, a, at an international and, and national level. Louise? Thank you, Madeline. Um, I hope the microphone is okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank uh, Madeline, uh, Pablo, and Duncan for the opportunity and for hosting this discussion, which I think uh, it's a good part two to thinking about norms and going a bit deeper on that and understanding some of the challenges and thinking together, which I think is the whole purpose of uh, this panel. Um, so I, I think, well, the question of the day is, um, and as Adley, Martin, and Leonie already said uh, and tackled very well, um, what do certs and C-certs do and how they think they about the challenges and opportunities that come up when we associate them with science diplomacy, right? So I think I'd like to suggest that there are at least three dimensions uh, that need to be considered in, t in talking about di diplomatic characteristics of the activities of certs. Um, unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time to go deep into each of them, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll get that to, uh, to discuss that in, in, in the debate. Uh, but the dimensions that I think are necessary for us to tackle this is first the international cooperation between national certs and, uh, and C-certs, the cooperation of certs uh, and, and C-certs at the national level, and most importantly, the relationship between national certs and other stakeholders, and in this case, uh, mainly the government, which I think has come up over and over again, uh, this kind of relationship in the previous uh, speakers. So that is why um, I'd like to suggest uh, that we not stick only with the idea of science diplomacy, but take a step into the broader idea of certs as embedded into this political scenario of national and international cybersecurity uh, uh, tensions, uh, which is really undeniable because even though sometimes you have silos and different stakeholder groups trying to make sense of what cybersecurity is, they are inevitably connected to each other um, and, and there's many spillovers as we saw already. Uh, so how does a particular political context play into effect and help us understand the role of CERT? So um, let me give a quick example. Um, that I have been researching uh, more deeply. So throughout the cycle of international events hosted in Brazil in the past years and starting mostly in the Rio Plus 20 conference of 2012, um, what we have seen is a demand for the development of inter internal mechanisms, and I think that's a global trend also, uh, of internal mechanisms to respond to incidents and level up cybersecurity capacities, right? So responding to this demand, we saw a great deal of institutionalization of cybersecurity through the proliferation of policies, including the development of national strategies and the establishment of a cyber defense center, and later a cyber command in Brazil. In this context, the National CERT was actively engaged in educating, building skills, being part of the training, un making other stakeholders understand what do CERTs do. Um, and I think that's a concern that Martin and Adley uh, shared very well over here. So this was a particular moment where we see these three dimensions that I mentioned before, and, and the national CERT worked directly with the National Defense Center, Cyber Defense Center, with the intelligence agency, with other stakeholders throughout this period. And the thing is that CERTs have become indicators uh, of cybersecurity development and maturity, and many governments have sought to establish or even restructure the place of CERTs uh, within the national cybersecurity uh, institutions and structures in order to pursue this idea of good national cybersecurity uh, mechanisms. 
And this is in part of what I'm inclined to think about as somehow a, re a surfacing of cybersecurity as uh, a concern on the national and international agendas and that that is perhaps what uh, we were talking about when we talk about the nationalization or, or the politicization of cybersecurity. And incidents such as, as we've seen and talk over and over again, wanna cry, have been contributing to this horizontal spread and shared concern. And it has become both an object of political dispute as well as a concern of how individuals, on the other hand, are very exposed and vulnerable. But while on the practical side, on, on the day-to-day -day notifications and circulations uh, between C-certs and, and, and certs, it seems as if they are performing a purely technical support. Uh, C-certs can and have been playing a meaningful role in establishing channels for building confidence between countries and among national cyber-related institutions, be it through the example of national certs such as AP-cert, uh, encompassing 30 certs, throughout the region, which includes Japan, Taiwan, and China, or the establishment of thematic context-specific time-bounded search, such sea search, such as in the case of Brazil and the Olympics, they established the Rio Olympic sea search to promote greater cooperation and coordination. So these trust networks are, and, and, and building, and the somewhat neutrality um, discourse highlights how the relationship among sea search is an evidence of cooperative structures. And uh, let me just close by, by sharing a very interesting conversation that I had with one of the uh, uh, colleague that works uh, in, in a CERT, and, and he came up to me and said, well, even if everyone does their homework in terms of security, it doesn't mean that we're really secure. So we have gotten to the point where not only do we have to understand that cybersecurity is and should be a shared concern and responsibility, but the actors such as C-certs and certs, especially the national ones, they are part of the political dimension of this debate. We need then to look at certs as part of a cybersecurity governance ecosystem. So I believe the question and challenge for us to think about cybersecurity as an issue uh, is for us to think about cybersecurity as a governance issue and in the sense, a question, what are the impacts of this surfacing effect of cybersecurity and the shared concern, and how do we keep leveraging common interests to preserve cooperative structures such uh, as certs, and, and how do we still keep this kind of flexibility and these trust networks while at the same time understanding this process of shared concerns and this process of surfacing uh, of cybersecurity uh, internationally and nationally. So where do we establish and how do we get to this kind of equilibrium, which now seems com some, somewhat uh, a skeptical question to ask, but it is a necessary one when we think about cyber norms. So um, thank you. Thank you, Louise. So I think those, those four interventions really start the conversation between these, these two communities, the, the academic community who studies these things and the technical community, the, the, the academic community who studies these things from a, a national and an international cybersecurity perspective, and the technical community who sees, as Martin said, this not as a national issue, as a global security, cybersecurity issue, and, and the mechanisms for approaching that. And I'm proud that we hand over right on time uh, to my colleague Duncan Hollis, who now will bring in the uh, uh, international um, policy community. Thank you, uh, Madeline. So, I, first of all, I just want to uh, want to apologize. My voice is a little bit uh, woke up this morning with this sound, so it won't be all that pleasing to you. But I'll try and communicate nonetheless. I want to first of all say thanks to, to Madeline and Pablo, who I'm clearly the junior partner at this table. Uh, they, they, I think, crafted this plan, and I, I'm along for the ride, so to speak. But in listening to our first part of our conversation, it strikes me what we heard was what I'd call like a descriptive approach, right? We were thinking about how do the academics describe uh, and and visualize what the CERT and C-CERT community does. How does the C-CERT uh, community envision itself? Like, what do they experience and the like? But as has been alluded to several times, there has been for the last several years this movement to treat CERTs not just as actors but as subjects, and particularly subjects of this norm-making process that we've seen in various international fora. As we've entered a world where cyber diplomacy is now a thing, and we have cyber diplomats, some of whom are sitting in the room with us, um, that there has been this question of what role should the CERT as a subject of this normative project, what role should they have and what role um, um, 
Do we want, not just for those that already exist, but let's also remember that what we're seeing is a continuing expansion of the certain CSER community and that there are countries right now that are looking at developing and putting in place um, national certs or national CSERTs or taking what have previously been private uh, CSERTs and moving them into a national government. And there are a set of questions, normative questions about how should that be done, what should be the boundaries for that, should there be some autonomy re remaining in the CSERT, should, what relationship should it have with law enforcement and the intelligence community, et cetera. So I think um, I'm going to ask actually um, uh, Vladimir uh, Radonovich uh, from Diplo to kind of give us at least a little initial overview uh, of where that normative vision for CERTs has come from and where it's at right now, and then we'll bring in actually some of our uh, government folks and some of our folks from the ICT community to offer their views. Thank you, Duncan, and <clears throat> I apologize, I won't be looking at a camera. Um, so two bits of, uh, of research that might be useful. One is with regards to the risks. Um, so the whole environment has changed, as we've heard also yesterday, uh, with the entrance of states uh, and with cyber armament. So what we try to do uh, is map the uh, countries that actually say that they have um, offensive cyber capabilities. And there is a map which is also available, you'll see it in this uh, IGF daily uh, and on our digital watch observatory, which shows that uh, there is about, there is uh, 20 countries at least that say themselves that they, they have offensive cyber capabilities. Of course, some of them are more or less responsible saying how they're going to use it, some not. Um, there are at least nine more which have strong indications that they have, and probably many more, because um, much of the offensive cyber capabilities are hidden within the defense um, framework uh, as sort of a uh, preemptive uh, defense uh, and so on, and even uh, intelligence. So that's, that's one bit of information which changes, which is sort of a, a changing uh, a game when it comes to also the role of the search. And then the other, the other um, bit of research is um, the research Diplo did uh, earlier this year, and unfortunately it's still quite accurate because there were no changes in the UNGG process um, with the new report, otherwise we would have to update it. Um, and basically it, it serves um, to compare or um, uh, compare the, the, the norms and uh, the, the report of the UNGG 2013 and 2015 with the OSC CBMs, with the Asian Regional Forum work plan on, on security, and with the um, Organization of American States um, cybersecurity strategy and the declaration strengthening uh, cooperation in cybersecurity and so on. And um, one of the, the findings in that, now focusing on CERTs particularly, is that there are a couple of instances where did these documents refer to CERTs directly or indirectly. Um, there, there is a whole uh, set of things which is related to uh, enhancing CERT cooperation and incident response. And one of those is what Madeline mentioned uh, at the beginning, what the GGE said of not conducting or knowingly supporting activities ag against CERTs or using them in cyber attacks. But there is another one which is, uh, for instance, um, highlighted by the GGE and the OAS, is establishing CERTs, including for the protection of critical infrastructure, and facilitating cooperation among CERTs, such as exchanging information and known vulnerabilities, attack patterns, and best practices for mitigating the threats. Then, coordinating responses, then organizing exercises, then supporting each other in handling incidents, then facilitating regional cooperation. So that's something that probably the search should also take into, into account. Those are the very specific um, links. There are also those um, not directly linked to search, but that obviously could be attributed to search. Uh, one set of measures is about encouraging the exchange of information, and particularly the uh, OSC and the Asian Regional Forum uh, have a link to um, encouraging experiences and or sharing experiences and lessons learned in dealing with threats and creation of regional databases of potential threats and possible remedies in cooperation with working with CERTs. That's particularly the OAS, uh, the OAS uh, document. Then we have. Um, a couple of uh, points on appointing contact points. So um, OSC and GGE say, uh, more or less, uh, nominating a national contact point and provide contact data of existing national structures such as CERTs, updating contacts annually and notifying about changes. And this is a big question of what is the difference between national contact points and CERTs. Um, this is something that's emerging. It's more or less can be clear to us, but it's not normatively clear. And then sharing information among appointed contact points and establishing a contact directory database without duplicating certain networks. That's particularly within the Asian Regional Forum and the GG. 
And then lastly, um, there is a point related to critical infrastructure, um, which goes on uh, providing channels for online information sharing on threats to critical infrastructure and modalities for real-time information sharing together with certs. That, that's the Asian Regional Forum. And at the end, there are a couple of bits, because all these documents also relate to um, capacity building, there are a couple of bits which simply talk about the need for capacity building, and some of those are particularly related to incident response, um, including incident response capabilities, CERT and CERT-to-CERT -cert cooperation capabilities, which is quite interesting. And uh, for instance, the OAS uh, suggests cap uh, capacities on how to report a cyber incident and to whom. And I'll stop with that because I think this, is, this gives uh, an idea where CERT is mentioned in these documents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vladimir. Uh, I think that's a great overview, and it, it does highlight the fact that we have now, for the last several years, in various um, uh, international fora, seen this, these efforts to, by non-certs, right, these other actors, often governments, to put on uh, the cert community and or their relationships certain norms of behavior. So what I'd like to do now is actually bring in uh, a few of our, the folks who've been kind enough to, to come here who have experience representing governments. I'm going to introduce them as a group and then let them kind of respond uh, in seriatim. Um, we, um, and, and, we have Karsten Geyer, who uh, has represented the German government on these issues for some number of years, and also ha has, uh, has recently chaired the GGE from last summer that failed to reach a consensus report. Um, that I, I did. I did. I, um, I, I, it's kind of hard not to, Karsten. Um, um, but, it, but most people know this. Um, um, we're also joined by uh, Tobias Viken, who's represented the Australian government, uh, um, and uh, Gavin Willis, who's all represented the UK government, I think, at the GGE in 2009 and 10 was his, his last go-round. And for the group of you, I'm kind of curious, and you can cherry-pick from the following kind of set of questions. One, I'm kind of interested to know from your perspective or your understanding of the international conversations, why have C certs or certs been brought into the, this international dialogue? What is, what's been the motivation that's made them a, a feature and a key feature of these lists of voluntary norms, of these CBMs, et cetera? A uh, second question is, how do you understand the relationship of C certs to national governments? And I understand when I use that term C certs, it actually probably needs to be disaggregated. We have, on the one hand, certain national uh, or the nationalization of C certain C certs, and I guess that may be the one that's of most interest. But of course, uh, as Adley suggested earlier, we have plenty, if not a majority, of certs that are privately oriented. And then Martin actually made the point that in some ways, C certs and the private cybersecurity or the antivirus vendors, et cetera, often perform similar functions. And if, you know, why are we focusing on only national C certs in this role, and why are we not offering similar norms or what have you for the private folks, let alone the industry that's engaged in, in much the same activity? And the third question is, is the one that this whole panel raises, which is, is there peril or potential in this idea of cert diplomacy? That is, is this uh, an idea that from a government perspective has appeal, particularly given the current geopolitical environment where if the politicians, the diplomats can't talk to one another, maybe the scientists can? Or are there problems that, uh, that as Martin, for example, suggested, you know, does it resonate with you when he says that some political acts could make the CSERP behavior more difficult? So that is a, a, a probably more questions than any of you individually have time to answer, but I wanted to kind of situate it to get the, the government perspectives to weigh in. And Karsten, um, I will, uh, if, if it's okay with you, give you the privilege of, of taking the floor first. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Duncan. And um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm happy to thank you for giving me an opportunity to explain failure, uh, which I won't do, by the way. Um, but I will allow abuse the floor um, to make a comment and then maybe set a little bit of the, the background on, on where, what the GGEs have been doing so far. The comment is that I have been listening attentively to this conversation and wondering if we are, if we aren't talking past each other. I mean, cyber diplomacy to me is about solving problems which the world wouldn't have if we didn't have an internet. Um, but I think we may have been problem been discussing a problem this morning which doesn't exist at all. Um, and that is because I think we may be discussing um, two different levels of problems. Um, and I believe that, as a matter of fact, the, the CERT or CSERT community um, 
plays an important role at both levels a primary role at the first level and a secondary role at, at, the, uh, at the second level. Let me explain. Um, what the, the cyber diplomats, you know, the people representing governments on matters of um, ICT use do is they try to agree the rules that apply to state behavior with regard to, to information and communication technologies. In particular, the primary target of cyber diplomacy must be to prevent the use of, not the use of information communication technology in international conflict, but to prevent international conflict to emerge inadvertently, involuntarily, from incidents which have happened in cyberspace or which are, are due to the use of information and communication technologies. So you can imagine a scenario in which, um, I don't know, in one country you have a serious um, ICT incident and the government rightfully or wrongfully um, attributes that to another government and that other government says, but it wasn't us and then, uh, you know, tempest flare and, and this escalates. These are the kinds of scenarios, or this is an important uh, scenario about which we are, we are talking. But this means that the, the cyber diplomats, the, the people representing the governments, only come into play at a relatively late phase of the game. Um, they only come into play if, if an incident has escalated to the points where the technical communities, the certs and the C certs, have not resolved it. And so far, fortunately, I think almost all incidents have been resolved at the technical level without government interference. And that is a very good thing. Um, and I would very strongly encourage the CERT and C cert community to continue doing what it has been doing so far very successfully which is to establish its own patterns of interaction and rules of procedure and establishing its own channels of communication um, to manage the myriad of incidents uh, that we see every day so they don't ever come to the attention of people like myself. Um, and this also maybe uh, Vlada explains the role of the contact, co contact points that we've been establishing in the OSCE area and, and, and uh, in other regional contexts and which the UN, United Nations has been encouraging. Those are the, the political contact points for, for, uh, for incidents which really are at the, at the risk of jeopardizing international peace and security. They're not meant to replace cert to cert contacts. That's a very important point. So anyway, um, let me maybe, Duncan, if you allow me, just explain a little bit on where, where we are in the, in the United Nations or with the, with the GGEs. So um, discussions on information communication technology in the context of international peace and security have been going on at the United Nations since 1998, which is when the Russians brought this to the General Assembly. Um, at first, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for the topic um, for any number of reasons, but one of the reasons was that people didn't understand what was going on. Now, the United Nations is not different from any other big organization that's faced with a new problem. If it doesn't know how to handle the new problem, it asks a group of experts to study the matter and revert. And in the UN context, that's uh, called a group of government experts. So 2004, 2005, the uh, General Assembly convened a group of government experts to study the matter, and uh, that group met, and it couldn't agree on a consensus report, setting a very unfortunate precedent for a later GGE. Um, the General Assembly was not discouraged uh, by this uh, lack of consensus and convened another GGE in 2010-2010. Gavin Williams, who's sitting across the table from me, actually sat on that, that GGE. Um, and so um, every, uh, all, uh, every development that, that followed from uh, since 2009-2010 is Gavin's fault. Um, but, but that GGE um, did produce a consensus report 
which concluded that existing and potential threats in the sphere of information security may cause substantial damage to international security and that their effects carry significant risk for public safety, the security of nations, and the stability of the globally linked international community as a whole. So what this m means is that in 2010, after only 12 years of negotiations, finally the United Nations uh, arrived at the consensus that yes, there is a problem. Mind you, uh, the United Nations has on occasion been overtaken by glaciers. Um, so the, 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 GG, the United Nations, uh, the General Assembly convenes in 2013 another GGE, and that one produced, uh, Gavin, with all due respects, neither one of us were on that group. Um, so that group actually succeeded in producing a landmark report, which uh, said that international law, and particularly the UN Charter, is applicable and is essential to maintaining international peace and stability. And following on the heels of that success, there was a 2014-2015 GG, so that was the fourth, which offered insights on how existing international law applies, but also a set of voluntary, non-binding, legally non-binding norms of responsible state behavior to reduce the risks to international peace, security, and stability. And those non-binding norms actually also covered um, behavior of governments with regard to the role of certs and c-certs. And the idea was to protect exactly what the certs, the c-certs are doing um, to, to encourage their very positive and stabilizing role and to prevent them from, or to prevent them being politicized um, in, the, in the business between governments. Um, so that was the, the idea of, of bringing the certs and c-certs into, into the norms part of the 2015 GGE report. And then the 2016-2017 GGE um, was convened, convened to, tr to deepen and to universalize the findings of the 2015 GGE report. Um, and um, experts on that group uh, were, wanted to, to produce a report, what they called a report plus, which would give very concrete recommendations to governments on how to implement the, uh, the recommendations contained in previous GGE reports. And we got very close. So in June uh, of, of this year, 23rd of June, we had about, I don't know, more, far more than 90% of our report uh, consensualized. But there was one point on which uh, it was impossible to, to reach agreement. And so, unfortunately, we had to report failure to the, uh, the general secretary. Um, it was certainly not for lack of trying, and it was also not for, uh, uh, for lack of advice received. Um, anyway, um, the discussion right now is how to take this forward, where to go next. Uh, I won't bore you with that. Um, but maybe one final word is, I believe that cyber diplomats, that govern governments, should refrain from interfering in the work of the CERT, C-CERT community. Uh, it's important work. It's been going on very, very well for a number of years without us getting into their way. And I think we sh we're well advised to continue not getting into the way of C-CERT and CERTs and, and, and these, these experts. At the same time, I believe that we are well advised to listen to the advice we're getting from the technical experts, from the CERT, C-CERT community, where it is offered, because otherwise there's a good chance we'll, com we'll write completely gobblegosh and, and non produce nonsense. And um, a number of, of GGE experts have had technical experts, um, CERT members in their, as advisors in their teams, and we've all benefited from it in our discussions. I'll stop it there. So th thank you very much, Karsten. I'm, I'm particularly impressed that you did in, in you know, less than like eight minutes an entire survey of the history of the group of government experts. So, um, but I want to invite both uh, Toby and Gavin to kind of contribute, um, maybe not so much on the GGE process generally, but I think you've situated where the C CERT and C-CERTs fit into it. But the more, the, the questions in, in terms of taking that as a foundation, wh what are your thoughts on this question of CERT diplomacy? What is the right role for a CERT from a national perspective? Is national a good thing, but keeping them still autonomous, or, or what, what are your views? So I'll, I'll turn it over to either of you who wants to take the floor first. 
very kind. Gavin, Gavin's let me go first. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Um, I think there's a temptation as one of these so-called cyber diplomats um, that we overuse certs. They are like one of the most wonderful diplomatic tools and partners that you can have when you're in a discussion because um, basically you're dealing with the operational community whose concerns are based around how do I get the job done, not how do I deal with politics. Um, and it's, it's incredibly useful. I, I'll use a very clear case study, um, track one dialogue with China last week. There was a lot of difficult discussions that we had, but at the end of it, we signed an awesome agreement between our certs and found out all these amazing case studies of where they were assisting one another in fighting cybercrime and assisting with threat sharing information. So it's like, you know, it's your, it's your second track of, of, of diplomacy going on behind the scenes and getting the job done. So something I have to be careful of is not you know, pointing the finger at them too often, our national cert team, and saying, hey guys, can you, can you do something more for us? Because they're already stretched. Um, so in that regard, they're absolutely part of the diplomatic toolkit that we have, I think, in Australia, and I see it in many other countries as well. And, you know, they play a vital role from, from Australia's perspective in our bilateral relationships in, in a regional setting. Um, we chair AP Cert, and we're very proud of that. Um, they do incredible work in bringing the community get together and, and sharing that with us diplomats, uh, us Luddites in, in, in the foreign affairs world, and making sure that we're aware of the work that they do and, and how we can capitalize on that. Um, we conversely try and push funding so we can support good project works that they have, and there's a number of projects that um, the Australian CERT are, are working on now, um, especially in the Pacific, in, in building those linkages, uh, operational linkage, linkages and bringing together of people around the Pacific who are going to be either be involved in the setting up of CERTs or who, or who are already involved in the CERTs. Um, I think there is also a very strong role that CERTs can play and, and something we started doing a lot of now from, from Australia's perspective in building the linkage between international law and norms and how they actually relate to operational issues. Um, and, and we found a very willing partner with our CERT team who are happy to come into the room and talk about operational issues and how the law, how norms are actually directly applicable to the kinds of operational issues that they're dealing with. And we found that probably one of the single most useful ways of making norms and international law uh, more visible and uh, more comprehensible to a range, a broader range of states um, than otherwise might have been the case. Um, I think, you know, they, they do all manner of good work, which has already been described. Um, but I think I'll go back to where I started and then tie up so we can have a bit more of a discussion. But I think there is that danger that we, we lean on them too much. And I think that's my concern. Um, and and it's, it's important not to spoil this very practical operational focus that they have and ensure that, you know, some of the, the geopolitics don't spoil some of the really good work that they do. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, respond to Carsten uh, in a way and uh, explain that I'm fairly recently back from the ITU World Telecom Development Conference in Buenos Aires, where I was the, the, the European Cybersecurity Coordinator. Um, at that conference, we failed to agree a new cybersecurity resolution, so I'm happy to join Carsten in the team of people <laughs> who's been failed in international cybersecurity negotiations. Um, <coughs> moving on closer to the, uh, the subject of the day, um, uh, first of all, we've got to be careful to avoid uh, generalisation. Um, all certs are different. All national certs are different. The UK national cert is now in its uh, third iteration of structure. It's part of the National Cyber Security Centre, which is part of GCHQ, and the minister for which is the Foreign Secretary. And I doubt if any other national cert reports to its foreign minister. That's really quite an unusual situation. Uh, each nation should make its own decision as to where the CERT lives and what its constituency is. And we have a structure that works for the UK. Most likely, it would not work for other nations. We do not believe that one size fits all. Our national CERT has a very strong outreach program. We cooperate bilaterally, regionally, and at times globally. For several years, we've been leading members of EGC, which is a private club of European government CERTs. During the negotiations for the EU Network and Information Security Directive, we strongly supported the proposal to form an EU CSERT network, and that um, directive obliges the EU national CERTs to meet regularly. We are also a member of FIRST. Inserting a note of reality, uh, the performance of national certs is likely to, be, likely to be judged on how well the national networks are defended. So international cooperation must have a business case. 
and there will be priority calls made. The case is often very clear. If a neighbouring country has a problem, it may well affect the UK and we may, may, may face a similar issue. So we have a very strong relationship with the national certs of all our near neighbours. Again, being, being realistic, it's easy to justify a continuing and close relationship if the flow of data is in both directions. All should try to give as well as take and should behave in a trustworthy manner. Trust must be earned, by the way. Leaping to a somewhat higher level, there are agreed norms from the GGE, as we've heard, uh, for, in particular for the exchange of information. National certs are actually in a position to be conduits for that as part of their usual work and should, wherever possible, be open to requests for assistance or information from other nations. We're very clear that we want all nations to have effective national certs. The title of this session includes diplomacy. There are many definitions of diplomacy. If diplomacy is the external presentation of a nation's policies, such as a free, open, and secure internet, then yes, indeed, the certs do have an opportunity to contribute to that. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. So <clears throat> we've heard from a variety of uh, stakeholder communities so far. We've heard from the academics. We've heard from the, the technical C-cert community itself. Uh, and we've heard a bit from uh, the perspective of the quote-unquote cyber diplomats. And I want to actually turn now, before we open this up to the, to the room and the remote participants, to our kind of two separate final communities that have a, may have a view on this question of CERT diplomacy. And uh, so first we have on behalf of kind of the ICTs, we have Jan Neutze, Director of Cybersecurity, um, uh, Global Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy at Microsoft, can maybe offer us a little bit of a perspective on, from the Microsoft perspective, how you all see, obviously, the importance of C-certs, but where, where do you come out in this idea of the politicization? How much more should they be integrated into a, a, the cyber diplomats toolkit, as Toby suggests, versus the Martin view of keep, we've been working well enough alone, keep us, keep, let's like, leave us alone sort of perspective. And then finally, Alina Noor, um, who's the Director of Foreign Policy and Security Studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Malaysia. Um, I'd be interested to know, both from kind of a research perspective Perspective and out from outside what has been a largely um, Western conversation so far on this panel, you know, how does it, how from like a Malaysian or other, that kind of perspective, is this conversation viewed and what you might contribute? Um, but I'll ask Jan if it's all right to intervene first. Sure. Thank Thanks, Duncan. And I, um, I think I can, or from a Microsoft perspective, we would agree with a lot that was already said. Um, so I'm not sure I have a, a whole lot of new points to add, but. Um, let me, let me just try to add some color commentary at, at a minimum. I think, you know, throughout much of this, this week, actually, it's been very interesting for us to see how much discussion there has been, not only about cybersecurity, but the evolving cyber threat landscape, um, the need for, for cybersecurity norms, um, or, or, or even this conversation around, around a treaty. Um, but we've heard from many people, of course, also in response to some of the things we've proposed, uh, that tr treaties take a long time and, and uh, are, are very cumbersome. Uh, and so, you know, I think it is important for us to, to, to address these questions in sort of a multifaceted way. And I think we, we need to make sure that we uh, address this sort of practical reality that we live in, that the threats really are increasing. Uh, we, 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 are, we are seeing a proliferation of nation state actors in cyberspace, of sophisticated groups, some organized crime. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are concerned about the impacts of, of these disruptive cyber attacks. Uh, and so as a result, I think it is really important for us to think about not just longer term measures, such as norms, how to implement them and potentially more binding agreements, but also more immediate steps. And I think this is where um, uh, thinking uh, about, about uh, the CERT community and, and, and what, what it can do is actually uh, critical. And so in that context, I'll just say sort of three, make, make three brief points. One, I think it's, it's incredibly, it remains incredibly important to build out national incident response capacities. Uh, certs do play a critical role, as we heard, in, in analyzing and responding to incidents. Uh, and I think the, the, the key piece here is um, that there is a significant um, uh, difference and, and variety in the capabilities that they have, even in um, regions such as, such as the one we're in, here, here in, um, in Europe. Uh, give you an example. Um, it, it is, um, it was, for us, it was really interesting to see as Within the European Union, the Network Information Security Directive, NIS Directive, the, sort of Europe's first real cybersecurity regulation, 
uh, was adopted. Um, at the start of that negotiation, by far not all European Union member states uh, had a national cert. Um, just as by far not many of them had a national cybersecurity strategy. This is sort of in the sort of circa 2012 to 2013 context. The situation has, has significantly improved, although there are a couple of member states at this stage who have just recently actually inaugurated their, their, their national certs. Um, and so I think it is, it is uh, important in that context to, to then also think about some of the proposals that are made, uh, for example, in the NIS directive, which talks about the need for mandatory um, information sharing, both from companies to, 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 to national regulators, but also uh, has put in place uh, essentially requirements for governments to exchange information. Now, the details, of course, are, are still being worked out. And that really brings us to this point of uh, there's a, a difference between uh, mandatory incident notification and, and sort of top-down coordination mechanisms and and uh, and voluntary information sharing, which CERT communities for many years have been doing and have been very, very good at it. I think we just need to be mindful as governments regulate this space, and by the way, we do believe there is there is room for regulation here, um, but we do need to be mindful that we preserve these voluntary uh, information exchanges and these and these trusted networks. So that's maybe one point. I'll say a little bit more um, on on um, about uh, trust, I think, you know, it, it's been mentioned before, building out that trust is absolutely critical. Again, uh, using the example of what we're seeing here in Europe, uh, prior to this directive coming into force, we had a situation where um, just like industry isn't sharing certain uh, threat information uh, with all EU member states or, or, or countries globally, uh, also countries within the EU weren't necessarily all sharing with all 28, right? And, and so there are there are reasons for, for, for uh, the different sort of levels of trust, and, and I think building out that trust it does take time. You can't regulate trust. Everybody figured that one out. And so you know, not, how do we actually build that mutual understanding? How do we build capacities for, for responding to large-scale incidents? How do you exercise that? And then throughout those, those processes, uh, over time, build, build, that, build that trust. Um, again, I think there's a, a really interesting framework in place for this now, but, but it needs to be filled with life, and it's, it'll be interesting to see how much of that can become a model maybe for, for, other, for other parts of the world as, as well. And then finally, just a sort of a, maybe a, a stretch goal, um, and, and, and maybe a little bit more provocatively, to think about how can we leverage certs to actually increase transparency and accountability in cyberspace uh, through informing um, the processes that are needed for cyber um, a, a attack attribution. I want to be very careful here because I don't think certs um, should be the ones actually conducting public attribution processes. That's a political process, and I think we've just seen that very recently where at the political level uh, there have been decisions to attribute, for example, the WannaCry attack. Um, but certs have significant technical and operational capability, and one of the things that I think has hampered uh, more coordinated attribution to date is that there simply aren't common methodologies in place, that there aren't necessarily common uh, thresholds uh, determined. And, and of course, every attribution case is, is, is different. Um, but I think um, using, uh, I think governments would be well served to, to leverage some of the expertise and, and see how that could get coordinated um, that, that, that does reside in certs. Um, so that's, those are sort of three points. I, I want to finish, though, with, I think you, you know, answering your question, Duncan. Um, more directly, as has been said before, I think it's incredibly important that for certs to work effectively, they cannot and they should not be politicized. Certs are not, uh, people working in incident response are not diplomats, and, and nor should they be. Um, and I think we need to recognize this absolutely critical role that certs are playing in, in our increasingly digitized world as first responders. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of the the first and last best uh, hope that we have, and, and so they need to be able to function without technical or political interference. Thanks. Thanks. I'll just start off by saying that um, in, in the region that I come from, Southeast Asia, and probably the wider Asia-Pacific region, there is a lot of high regard for the 
uh, technical community. And part of the reason for that is because of the uh, prioritization of uh, the economic and commercial benefits and opportunities that come with the internet in, in Southeast Asia primarily. There is a lot of prospect that's seen in using the facilities provided by the internet to uh, develop a country and all the commercial um, opportunities that come along with that. There's also unfortunately a lack of awareness of, of the policy discussions surrounding cyberspace, which is why there is this um, alternative focus on the technical community and capacity building instead. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but for us who work in the policy uh, realm, um, I've been sitting here listening very intently, trying to square the circle between um, the, the technical community on the one hand and the policy community on the other, trying to figure out whether there is a convergence point, whether there should be a convergence point between the two. And I think after uh, listening to all the interventions, I, my, my start point was that um, let's leave the technical community to its own. And I think my position hasn't changed um, very much at all, having listened to all the interventions. And I say this because, uh, again, there are two different start points. You know, we've listened to how the technical community believes itself to be this international um, community that um, crosses borders. Um, but on the other hand, uh, when you have government agencies like the National Security Council in my country, that is the lead agency for cyber affairs, uh, which has a start point of securing borders, um, prioritizing secrecy, um, those are very different start points to begin with. And um, there is this huge gap between those start points that might never converge um, at any point. So when you have um, two very different beginnings and you have a history of uh, trust issues, of a trust deficit, for example, in Southeast Asia, even though we all share borders, we have uh, the historical legacy of trust issues, you have problems like how confidence building measures take 20 years before they can even be considered to evolve into preventive diplomacy, which is where we are at in the ASEAN Regional Forum, for example. Um, whereas the technical community can have points of contact quite easily, the policy community, on the other hand, has been negotiating points of contact for years. And from the outside, you would think that this would be fairly simple, you know, let's just identify a person and a phone number, but apparently it doesn't work that way in a policy community, at least not in um, ASEAN. Carsten mentioned that the UN has occasionally been overtaken by glaciers. Well, I would say that ASEAN has at times been overtaken by the UN. Um, and so again, how do you square this with the speed of technology and all the developments that come along with that? Uh, let me end on this point. I, I don't want to leave um, this discussion open-ended, at least from, from my point of view. Um, I will say that at the track two level, there are mechanisms that have been trying to sort of merge uh, the conversation between the technical and policy communities. And you have examples like the uh, Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, or CSCAP, which is supposed to mirror the ASEAN Regional Forum. And groups like CSCAP have been working in uh, smaller study groups trying to bring in both the technical community as well as the policy community in the same room to talk to each other, to try to understand issues better, and then to escalate whatever gaps or recommendations there might be to the track one official level. This has not always been successful. Um, there has only been one study group within CSCAP that has worked on cybersecurity issues, and that has largely been focused on the technical side of cybersecurity. There has recently been uh, a study group on maritime environmental protection, which as some of you may know, um, can be quite a contentious issue because of the South China Sea territorial dispute in our region. Um, and even then at the track two level, what we saw in discussions was government representatives, uh, sorry, non-governmental representatives taking on very strict national positions which stymied the discussion from the get-go. So even at the track two level, we have this problem of unshackling ourselves from national positions because not every non-governmental representative is truly independent or non-governmental, depending on which country you come from. 
So I'll end on that slightly pessimistic note with uh, just a, a bit of hope to say that it's possible to have a conversation as we are now, bringing in the technical and policy communities, but it might be better to leave the two separate so they can both do what they do best. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. This uh, train has gone uh, fast and we're soon to arrive to our stop. Uh, but uh, I would like to give the floor to Daniel uh, and then you. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Stauffacher from the ICT for Peace Foundation. And I, um, I cannot resist now to just come in a little bit because we have uh, several partners in this, in this room who have been involved with us and helping launching this cybersecurity policy and diplomacy uh, capacity building program, which started 2014 with the support of, of the UK, uh, but also Switzerland, uh, Germany, and especially also uh, uh, Australia, uh, which then started with OAS. Uh, and to say, you know, I mean, it was always the aim and the ambition to have both communities in those workshops. Uh, which is, is, is very interesting. Uh, I know the, the, understand now the complexities bringing them together, uh, but still uh, we believe that both communities have to understand the other language. Um, and we have now done a number of workshops also in the African Union uh, with uh, African Union states, and in particular also with uh, ASEAN Southeast Asia uh, several uh, workshops starting in, in, um, in Singapore 2015 and now also moving into what we call the CLMV countries. And both uh, Serge uh, was there talking and, and Adli were there to bring in the cyber, the, the CERT uh, component into. Uh, so we continue on that. I think it is an important model. Uh, we're going to continue in, in Cambodia in, uh, in, in May. Again, and it's interesting that um, the Cambodian host uh, renamed our workshop from cybersecurity policy and diplomacy to norms workshop. So thank you very much for my attention. Yes, Tom. Thank you, Pablo. Duncan. Uh, my name is Walter Natwis. I'm a consultant, and I used to be a consultant for the IGF Secretariat on the Best Practice Forum of CSIRT. So I worked a lot with Atli and Martin, uh, Christine, who's not in the room, I think, uh, people like Serge. And I would like to share a little bit of, of that work and then try to make the circle of the square a bit, a bit circled. Um, I think that what we're talking about is the proof of two alternate realities. The one is the one, the world of the internet where the governments were not present on really when it started really to take off and the one that is now trying to catch up and be involved. Uh, so we have first what we're talking about here, but this is the IETF, the Internet uh, the Engineer Task Force, there's the MOG, the Message Anti Abuse Working Group, there is ICANN, the RIRs, there is ICT companies that grew very global in a few decades <coughs> like Microsoft that are now alternate realities to what traditional diplomacy is about. And I think the fact that we're sitting here together discussing this is proving that we are trying to find each other and what the meaning of the different worlds is. There's also things like ISACs, but let's stop there with examples. The best practice forum of, uh, on, on CSIRT started in the summer of 2014, and I was pulled in at a very late stage, and reading all the documents, I said, you guys are not talking to governments. Your big question is, leave us alone, understand what we do, wh understand what our effect is on the global security. And I said to them, go and talk to them. And the first response was, you're not allowed to write that. <laughs> Two months, three months later, I was allowed to put in one recommendation, start talking to each other. A year later, they were in an OC OECD document, and the fact that we're talking here is proof that everybody's reaching out to each other. And I'm trying to make something a little bit round. Yes, we are in very different world. Diplomacy is a to totally different interstate thing while they are doing with colleagues that they know and trust and working. But where do you need each other? Where can you strengthen each other? And where can you make the world a bit safer together? And I think by having a, perhaps a bit different discussion that we're having now, but identifying the true <laughs> 
problems you run into and you run into and the IETF runs into in implementing their standards, etc., you will get a totally different discussion because then you're going to the heart of things. And yesterday, and then I'll finish, I gave one example. What, uh, and I talked to that to Mr. Jan Neutz there yesterday. And I gave this example. What is threatening individuals and institutions, organizations most inherent, insecure devices that come onto the market? So what if we started a working group within the IGF or elsewhere saying, two years from now, there's no device coming on the market that does not have some sort of an inherent building security. That is an, a goal, it is effective. Everybody on this planet will planet f uh, profit from it undiscriminately. So in other words, you can set a horizon together and you need all the pl players. So if that is something we could do, that could actually might change the world. Is the mic working? Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, time uh, has come to an end and the only thing that I would like to say is that we started in point A, we jumped into a train, uh, it went really fast. We hopefully uh, made some contact inside the train. We arrived at point B. I think point B is not a final destination, it's just uh, an intermediary uh, point. And um, uh, I think, or I hope, that uh, after we leave the train, we can still be in touch and perhaps uh, share a journey um, uh, another time. It has been a real uh, honor and privilege to have all of you uh, here and uh, uh, the, the YouTube link uh, was not uh, available uh, during the session but they tell me that it will be uh, perhaps by tomorrow. Uh, I have recorded the audio and the transcript work uh, pretty well. Um, the last word I would encourage the core group to meet outside for a, a picture. And uh, with that, uh, I thank uh, all of you to attend and uh, um, uh, we're welcome into any comments on the usual Twitter and other media. Thank you very much. Let's do the, the photo outside the room.